Hello, class, and welcome to, gosh, what week is it? Seven? Week seven already. Uh, we are cooking right along, and this week we're going to be talking about native plants and some of the reasons why they matter and why you should absolutely incorporate them in your home garden. So I hope you enjoy. This is something near and dear to my heart, and native plants really do fit in with just about any garden setting. So with that, let's jump in. So first, let's start with a definition. What is a native plant? And what you'll find if you start to dig into this topic is that there is no consensus on what clearly defines a native plant. But I did pull a few from some authority figures um, to kind of give you an idea of what natives can truly entail. A native plant is one that exists in a given region through non-human introduction, directly or indirectly. That's one way of looking at it. A plant that lives or grows naturally in a particular region without direct or indirect human intervention. That's coming straight from the USDA. With respect to a particular ecosystem, a species that other than as a result of an introduction historically occurred or currently occurs in that ecosystem. That's from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So you can see there's some, some interesting definitions there. Um, you know, locally we tend to think of native plants as something that grew before human settlement or before, you know, European colonization here in New Orleans. Um, however, plants have moved around historically in a number of ways. People move them, animals, birds move them, the wind can carry seeds, water can carry seeds. So plants do kind of shift and evolve on their own um, throughout different ecosystems. So just keep that in mind as we dig into this topic. Why do native plants belong in our gardens? There's a lot of reasons, and I hope that you guys get inspired to add some to your gardens after this. To gain a new appreciation of American flora, which is rich, diverse, and beautiful. You can create a sense of place in your garden by incorporating natives and a sense of belonging. So here in Louisiana, that could be putting some Louisiana irises in your flower beds. It's that simple. So you're getting a sense of where you live and connecting to your local ecosystem. To create mini ecosystems within habitat that has been developed over time. Many of us live in urban or suburban areas. Um, even if you're in a rural area, the landscape has changed drastically over time as human settlement has occurred. And what we do with planting native plants is create little mini pockets of habitat that wildlife can really benefit from. Native plants are best suited to local conditions and adapt to challenges related to weather and soil conditions. So what's great about natives is they're not fussy. They're from here. You can really kind of drop them and forget about them with minimal care. We're going to dig into that a little bit more. Um, but they are adapted for the heat, the humidity, the excess rainfall, the clay soil. Whatever challenge you have as a gardener, native plants from your area should be able to overcome many of those challenges. To foster diversity within a garden landscape, you know, it's great to have a nice um, sort of uniform, formal garden, but, you know, that's kind of boring. It's very passe, in my opinion. Um, I like a big, diverse garden um, with lots of color, lots of different shapes, forms, texture, and native plants really deliver on that. To connect to local ecological history and indigenous traditions, lots of native plants have um, use in Native American culture or in early colonial culture or in current human culture. So natives can kind of tie you to a larger history or a larger story. To support pollinators and other beneficial insect species, native plants are considered a better choice for meeting insect food and habitat needs. And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of specialist species within the insect world. Uh, monarch butterflies are perhaps one of the most famous where they only host, their larva only eats and consumes the milkweed plant. Um, so they are considered a specialist. You couldn't say move those caterpillars onto a boxwood Edge and they would not make it. So that's what I mean by specialists, whereas a generalist, this term will come up later, a generalist species of insect is able to host on a multitude of species. They're not host specific. So native plants can fill these needs for a lot of specialists, such as the monarchs. 
to support wildlife species, especially birds, in an increasingly urban world. Fledgling birds rely on insects as a food source. Native plants host many insects. The seeds also provide a source of food. Now this and the last slide I'm going to tie into the global insect decline, which has been well documented um, in the last few years. And there's some new research and data coming out that indicates that songbirds and many of our passerine birds are also in decline. So they depend on native plants and they depend on rich habitat and a multitude of species, not always cultivated species, to survive. Um, there's a good statistic out there that it, it takes um, a fledgling chickadee, some, some like a ridiculous number of caterpillars to actually get reared to maturity. And you know, out of our species here, the oaks um, actually host over 400 species of caterpillars. So that's an interesting connection where the oak is native, it hosts all these caterpillars, the birds use them to fledge their chicks, and it supports the whole food web. So keep that in mind as well. Once established, native plants do not require as many inputs, such as fertilizers and pesticides, compared to lawns and non-native garden landscapes, because they are adapted to local conditions. Um, there's a big push right now to shrink your lawn. Lawns do consume a lot of resources in terms of you know, fossil fuels from mowing and string trimming, um, pesticides, herbicides. It's just a high maintenance artificial situation. So if you shrink your lawn footprint and incorporate some natives maybe in some garden beds or maybe like a micro prairie, that's a very hot topic right now, um, you're actually conserving a lot of resources and your landscape becomes more green. Native plants can be integrated into existing landscapes and gardens. This is a question we get a lot here locally. Do I have to rip out my entire landscape and plant only natives if I want to be a, an eco-conscious or a green gardener? The answer to that is really no. <laughs> you can incorporate and mix things up. Um, you know, a good kind of baseline is 40% of your landscape. If that's native, you're, you're providing an awful lot of ecological services. You don't have to get rid of grandma's heirloom rose bush or that very special camellia that you got for your anniversary. You can really mix natives into your existing garden palette and you can do some really fun things with your landscape design. You don't have to start from scratch and you don't have to throw out those special plants that you've become attached to. So what does that mean for your home garden? Um, we did just touch on that, but there are many benefits to native plants, and this slide kind of sums them up. This is from the USDA US Forest Service. Native plants require no fertilizer or fewer pesticides compared to lawns. They require less water than lawns and can actually fight erosion. Many native species have extensive root systems, either fibrous or taproot systems, and they're able to kind of get into the soil profile and hold things in place and foster a healthy soil system at the same time. Um, those deep-rooted systems here locally actually help with our stormwater problem. We have a lot of urban flooding because we are below sea level here in New Orleans, and there's a big push to get native plants into our green infrastructure, our home landscapes, and our public spaces because they can help with some of that flooding by getting the water into the soil faster. So that's a really interesting use for natives here locally. Native plants help reduce air pollution. They require little mechanical maintenance. So that's your mowers, your string trimmers, your leaf blowers, things like that. Um, they actually do sequester carbon from the atmosphere just through their normal growth processes. Native plants provide food and shelter for wildlife species. That's going back to that ecological services push. Native plants promote biodiversity and stewardship of our natural heritage. So in gardening with native plants, you are doing something to benefit the ecology of your area. And finally, native plants are beautiful and increase scenic value. My whole yard is all natives in front and people regularly stop and take pictures and comment and it's just a beautiful, nice little area. So they can really jazz up your yard. This is an important debate, native versus native are. We defined a native species already, so what the heck is a native are? Um, this is a really good example here with this echinaceas, where on the left, we've got the straight native. This is the straight native echinacea. And then we have a native R, which is a cultivated form, on the right. Let's dig into that. A native R is something 
or a native R is sometimes a natural variation that has been found in the wild and brought into cultivation. So it's something that someone saw out there in the environment and said, that would look great in my garden. I'm gonna propagate that. I'm gonna get it into the nursery trade and people are gonna buy it to use in their yard. That's one way a native R can be developed. Often though, native R's are developed by plant breeders and would never be found in nature. So it might be a hybrid of two species that occur in totally different parts of the country or it might be a cross between a native species and a cultivated species. So there are a couple different ways that native R's can be created, but in general, they can either be created naturally or through plant selective breeding. And we did talk a little bit about that in some earlier modules. There are some pros to native R's. Um, they're easier than ever to find, at even the big box nursery stores. Um, they do offer improved hardiness for a greater geographic area. They're often bred for that. They add genetic diversity, so you're getting some different species into your area from different parts of the world. They sometimes have, and often have actually, a showy appearance that may have been selected for by plant breeders, such as a slightly different color, or a larger bloom, or a longer bloom time. So that's a good benefit right there. They're easier to cultivate or propagate for nursery sales because it has been bred for uniformity. Plant breeders don't want to put something out there where one plant comes out this tall, the others come out this tall. They want a nice uniform product that they can then in turn market through the garden centers and the nurseries. So you know what you're getting as a consumer and as a gardener. Many of the same benefits of straight natives occur also in native R's. So they're still pollinator plants. They still provide habitat. They still beautify our landscapes. Generalist insect species use native R's just as often as the straight species. This has actually been documented in some research as well. But there are some potential cons. And like I said, this is a fairly new topic, especially in the world of horticulture. Um, there are some ongoing studies, and I'm going to provide you some links in the resources page. So I encourage you, if this is something that interests you, to do some additional reading. Some potential cons would be a loss of original genetic material through breeding efforts and crosses. So that straight native then becomes diluted genetically over time as it's crossed into other lines. Um, that's something that can occur. Leaf-eating species at times prefer the straight natives. Um, it's been found that leaf color is often the biggest factor um, impacting this. Specialist pollinators often prefer the straight natives for nectaring or feeding. Those are our host-specific plants. Now, locally here in New Orleans, there is an exception to that that I've seen right in my own garden, where the monarch butterflies prefer the tropical species of milkweed to our native species. I have both planted side by side, and they'll eat that tropical milkweed first, like it's chocolate cake, and then they'll eat the Brussels sprouts, which are the native species. So that's something that doesn't always occur, but it is a potential um, con as well. More research is needed into species-specific preferences for habitat and food sources. So this is an ongoing topic in the scientific community, in the horticultural communi community, and it's gonna be interesting to see how it shakes out over time. So here's some um, potential straight native cons. Introduced pest and disease species can actually wreak havoc on native species in an ecosystem. And I think the emerald ash borer is a very good example of that. Um, this is an introduced species of insect that decimates the native ash populations. Um, the American chestnut is another tree species that was wiped out by an introduced disease pathogen. And now, if you see chestnut trees in cultivation, they're often an Asian species or some sort of hybrid Asian American species of chestnut. So that's something, you know, as we are increasingly in a global society, we're global gardeners, there's a lot of trade, a lot of things moving across the, the whole world, there is that potential always for invasive species and diseases to come and wipe out a native species. Um, and here in New Orleans, we are a port city, so we're actually one of the global hotspots for these things, unfortunately. <laughs> So here's some tips for finding which natives grow in your area. If you're interested in adding natives to your landscape, this is how you would go about doing it. In a lot of areas of the country, there is a state or a local native plant society. That's a great way to get connected. 
You can ask your extension agents, where here locally that would be Anna, Joe, and Chris. You can consult state-specific field guides. Um, oftentimes, you can pick up a field guide for your state, flip through, and if you see something that catches your eye, do a little research, and you might be able to find plants or seeds. You can consult the USGS plants database to see what occurs in your zip code. And then this is actually a new tool. Um, you can get online and check out the National Wildlife Foundation's Native Plant Finder. And what that is is you plug in your address, and then you get a suggested palette of native plants for your yard and garden. It's a really handy tool. This is actually my house here, and it's about 40% natives. Um, and my vegetables are right there as well. So I've got them incorporated just about everywhere on my property. There are some benefits for the home vegetable garden, and I'm going to outline them real quick here. They attract pollinators and beneficial insects. This is a nice little milkweed assassin bug. That guy is taking care of a lot of my caterpillar problems on my tomatoes, which is great. I have not had a whole lot of issues this season because I have a healthy population of these assassin bugs. There are a lot of edible native species. Um, this is something you can usually find books and other resources locally in your area for. Um, here are just some of them that we have here in New Orleans and their uses. Everything from tea to fruit, edible seed pods, edible leaves, wine even, um, root beer, all kinds of things. So native plants do have a lot of historical uses as a food source, and they can be added to your landscape and provide those same benefits. They beautify our yards and gardens. Here are some gateway natives. Um, we always get asked, you know, I don't want to jump in kind of whole hog. What should I start with? What's easy? Um, and then these are some things also that grow throughout most of the US. So I know we have a lot of students from kind of all over, not just Louisiana. So here are some things to check out if this is something that interests you. First and foremost, milkweed. Everyone loves the monarch. It's probably our most charismatic insect here in North America. A lot of people know what it is. Um, most schools are teaching about the monarch life cycle and why it's important. But what a lot of folks don't realize is that many other insect species host on milkweed. And here are just some of them. And if you notice, they're all kind of orange colored. That's very interesting, um, you know, because they're consuming the milkweed. The sap has some toxins. And this is a warning to other critters saying, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. So cool. So milkweed. You can definitely figure out what grows in your location. There's different species throughout the continental US. Um, they're not all going to work in every part of the country. So do some research and figure out which species of milkweed grows in your area. Rudbeckia, that's the black-eyed Susans. These are really easy to incorporate as well. They bloom all summer long. It's a nice splash of color. And many different species occur throughout the US. There are a lot of native R species of Rudbeckia out there in the nursery trade as well, so it's a little easier to find them now. And you can also seed them very easily. Bee balm or Monarda, this occurs throughout the US as well, and the hummingbirds love this. If you're interested in getting hummingbirds to your home garden, plant some Monarda. Solidago or goldenrod, now we see this on the roadsides as a weed in a lot of areas. However, there are some cultivated species or some native species that clump and are a little more well-behaved. And this is one of the showiest things you can put in your yard, and it attracts every pollinator for miles around. So if you're really interested in feeding the bees, you know, because the bees are in trouble, we did talk about that in the past modules, this is a really good thing to add to your yard. Echinacea. Um, there are a lot of echinaceas throughout the U.S. There's a lot of native R options as well. They come in different colors, um, different tints, mostly a hot palette, purples. Um, so that's something that you can find fairly easily and incorporate into your yard and garden. Stick to the natives if you can, but don't be afraid to take the plunge into some native R's if that's all you can find. Some tips for integrating natives into your existing gardens. Like I said, don't immediately rush out there with a shovel and a pair of loppers to pull everything in your yard that's not native out. Um, we've had people do this, and they usually regret it later. So don't be afraid to not do that. Um, any kind of design or landscape principles that apply to your existing landscape can be applied to natives. Uh, there's some really good books that are going to be in the resources that we're providing that can guide you here as well. But any kind of look, cottage garden, formal garden, 
Um, you can pull that off with native species just as easily. They can be integrated in with existing plantings. They can be fitted into small or large spaces. Even in container gardens, you can get some natives going. And then start with the easy ones, definitely. That'll just encourage you to get into them a little bit more. Here's some design ideas. These little wildflower corners are very popular. You could have this in the corner next to your vegetable garden even. Mixed into formal plantings or with a formal border, that could be a boxwood hedge or a fence. A rain garden or a bioswale. This is a very popular option here in New Orleans where if we have storm water that puddles in a part of the yard, why not dig that out a little and plant wildflowers so that when it rains and the water collects in that space, those native species can take full advantage of it. You don't have to mow that area and you no longer have a puddle. Containers and planters, natives do just great in those. Um, we actually have some natives planted in the French Quarter in some big containers, and that's a good way to show the general public what's possible. Meadows, not lawns, there's a huge push throughout the Midwestern and prairie states for this. So replacing your front lawn or a backyard with a meadow. And you can always just plant a native tree. Native trees have a lot of benefits. They host a lot of insect species. They sequester a lot of carbon and storm water. And you can actually dig into what's native in your area. I know the Ag Center here has a lot of resources, including a tree guide. Go out there and plant a tree. Um, this is a suggested book list. We're gonna include this as well with your resources, a little more um, detailed, but there are some good resources out there for you if this is a topic that interests you. We're just touching very briefly on it here, and it's something that you can really spend a lifetime getting into. Don't forget to post your lab results to the discussion board. Um, I look forward to seeing what everyone comes up with, and I do look at those, so be sure to get your pictures posted this week.